Very good. Um, so we'll talk about kind of the nuts and bolts of osteoporosis, osteopenia, um, get a little bit nerdy with what that is and isn't. Um, and then more importantly, what you all, y'all can do about it. Um, a couple of things that we won't dig into real deep and just kind of scratch the surface is things like, um, drugs, supplements, um, that sort of thing, which is a huge part of managing these conditions, but that's not really what I do. So I'm physical therapy, physical medicine is, is my specialty. Um, so things like what supplements work and which ones don't, I don't honestly know. Um, I can tell you what foods are good and the nutrients you need, that sort of stuff. But, um, most of that I'm going to defer to your primary care provider, um, someone who's specialized in those sorts of things. So, um, some, some nuts and bolts here, a DEXA scan is kind of your, your go-to, right? So if you don't know, um, if you've got osteopenia, osteoporosis, this is something, this is what your doctors are going to have you go through to check. So, um, the way that they kind of classify these things is they compare your bone mineral density as someone over the age of 65 or for men over 70, um, with the same sex, younger version of yourself. And they make the comparison between the density of the older folks and the younger folks and see what the difference is. So if they match, you're considered normal. You're in that first category there. Um, normal bone mineral density, healthy bones, low risk of a fracture. Um, osteopenia then is kind of the, the at risk category. If you want to, you want to call it that it's, it's the less, um, severe. And so the score that they used which you'll hear me refer to throughout this is called the T score. So if you have this T score between a minus one and minus two and a half, um, you're in that osteopenic range. And that's kind of the at risk where your bone mineral density is low, but it's not like hit the panic alarm. Okay. Once you get a T score past that negative two and a half, then you're in the osteoporosis. Uh, range. So you can be osteopenic and kind of that at risk, or if your bones are more porous, you're more at risk for a fracture, then you're considered having osteoporosis. Um, so a little visual here, normal bone to the one side, osteoporotic bone. Again, that's the, the more severe of the two, um, is off on that other side. The metaphor that gets used often is a bridge, right? So if you were going to choose a bridge that was built like the one on the left or the one on the right and hope that your car didn't collapse and go through the bridge, you're going to definitely choose the one on the left because that one on the right looks rickety. There's lots of air and space um, and it's really porous for bones and bridges. That means they're weak. Okay. So that's kind of your, your visual for normal versus osteoporotic. And, and ultimately that matters for a whole lot of reasons. Um, this flow chart looks at a lot of those things. So aging is the first one. That's why typically you're not going to get those DEXA scans until later in life. Um, it's kind of like at a certain age, you start getting colonoscopies at a certain age, especially if you're have other risk factors, you're going to start your doctors will likely start talking to you about getting a DEXA scan. Um, so age is one big thing. Menopause is another one as your hormone levels change later in life. Um, estrogen especially has a big role in bone health. Um, clinical risk factors here. That's basically if you have other comorbid conditions, if you've had cancer, if you spent a big chunk of your life smoking, things like that, that can increase your risk. Um, and then high bone turnover, which we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, and that kind of feeds into that bone loss. And then you add in things like propensity to fall and fall mechanics. So as you get older, maybe one of those comorbid conditions is diabetes. You've got some neuropathy in your feet. You're more prone to fall. Um, your fall mechanics, meaning 
your reaction time isn't what it was when you were 20. And so when you fall, you can't get yourself into a position to catch yourself quite as well or to land as safely as you might have. Um, and all that, again, filters towards now you've got weaker bones, you've got a higher chance of falling or falling, what we call falling poorly, falling where you're at a higher risk of hurting yourself. Um, and that can lead to fractures. And we can go down the whole rabbit trail of what fractures mean. Um, but there's a lot of really good data where if you have a fracture later in life and you're admitted to the hospital, um, not good things happen after that. It's just a general decline in your health. Um, if you have a hospitalization due to a fall and particularly hip fractures or lumbar fractures. So, um, there's this dance that goes on, right? And that's, that's kind of the whole crux of understanding osteoporosis, which is, it's not just a downhill, like I'm getting older, everything is going downhill. And that's the end of the story. There's kind of this, this song and dance that goes on between bones breaking down, but also bone growth. And there's a couple of things that really matter. The calcium and the vitamin D, which are kind of the big two that a lot of people are like, oh yeah, you know, drink my milk, all those campaigns about drinking milk to grow your bones. And, um, that's legitimate, right? So it's a vital mineral found in your bones. And if you have low calcium, then that kind of tells your brain to start removing bone because it needs calcium to function other places, There's lots of calcium in your bones. And so if you're low on calcium, your body is going to use the calcium available to it if it's not getting it from your food. So it takes it from your bones. There's kind of this bone removal process that happens. Okay. Vitamin D helps your body absorb the calcium in your food or in your supplements. If you're taking a, a calcium supplement, um, really interesting, uh, kind of tidbit here, which I didn't even plan on talking about, but it popped into my brain. Um, we just had my daughter who's 18 months old at her 18 month old, uh, pediatric appointment, like last week. And her pediatrician was saying, we asked, you know, do we need to check her vitamin D levels, iron, whatever. And she's like, well, actually the, the recommendations, and this isn't just for peds for kids, um, is that primary care providers don't even check vitamin D anymore. They basically are told by, you know, their powers that be assume that everyone has low vitamin D and just tell people to take it or make that recommendation. Um, especially if you're watching this from Alpena, Michigan, we don't get a lot of vitamin D for a lot of months out of the year when the sun is hiding. So um, I thought that was interesting. It used to be that it was like, well, let's check your levels and maybe you need to take some vitamin D. And they've basically found that over years of testing people, pretty much everyone had low vitamin D, especially up here. So they've largely done away with recommending testing and just said, you should probably take some vitamin D. So for all of the other reasons, but also because that's going to help you absorb your calcium. Um, we talked about estrogen a little bit. Um, that big hormone that helps promote bone growth. It's important for the bone metabolism, which is that rebuilding process. And then for me as a physical therapist, this stress column is the important one. And I'm not talking like mental stress. Um, this is physical stress, which is called Wolf's law. And that's that bones adapt and change to stress that you put on them. So, if you kind of think of it in the inverse, you hear people say all the time, oh, if you don't use it, you lose it, right? You've heard people say that about any number of things. Um, this is the inverse. In order to build bone strength and muscle strength, frankly, you have to use those structures. You have to put stress on those structures, okay? That input to your bones, that input to your muscles tells your brain, I need to give resources to that area so that it can handle the stresses that I put on it. So um, that's really the, the crux of what we're going to talk about today from a physical medicine perspective um, and what we can do about if you have osteoporosis and you know that already, 
um, or osteopenia, or if you just say to yourself, I'm kind of in that category of I'm of a certain age, I'm of a certain gender, um, I've gone through menopause, whatever the case may be, and you're like, yeah, that's something that I maybe need to have on my radar. Um, so we're going to breeze through these first two bullet points here because, um, again, it's not really my it's not what i do but i still want to make the recommendation so the first one is to talk with your doctor primary care um, whoever you're seeing they're going to help you identify any other risk factors that you may have that we didn't talk about to screen for it if you haven't had a dexa bone scan um, they can talk to you about how to go about getting that if they feel that it's relevant and necessary um, and then they can they're going to be the ones that prescribe supplements and medication um, and there's again this is one of those things that's not my specialty but i'm pretty good at reading research um, and the research into medication and supplements is that they are really helpful especially early on in the diagnosis of osteopenia osteoporosis um, mainly those first five years they can really make a big difference if you catch this early especially in the osteopenic phase before it progresses um, that you can really make a big impact with supplements and medication in those first five years um, which can buy you a lot of time and a lot of ability to remain active and do the things you want to do um, and then they can obviously talk to you about the side effects of specific medications or supplements, how those things react, um, all that stuff. That's not my wheelhouse. And then your food, which is kind of goes along with the supplements, um, because you want to give your body the, the tools that it needs to build healthy bones, right? So, um, going back to that bridge analogy, if you say, I need a bridge that can carry semi trucks and all you provide is marshmallows and toothpicks like you're in elementary school again that's not going to work right you've got to give your body the tools that it needs to build good bones so that's the calcium that's the vitamin d that's the vitamin c again can you take supplements yes what's better is getting it from your food okay so calcium that's going to be your your drink milk campaign right milk cheese yogurt healthy dairy products healthy fats vitamin d is going to be leafy greens broccoli legumes peanuts such figs salmon and tuna some of those things not exactly a huge part of the uh alpina michigan diet right we're not getting fresh figs around here very often um but salmon certainly that's you know huge up here um leafy greens visit your local farmer's market all that good stuff um get those nice fresh veggies and then vitamin c um which tends to be your citrus fruits, bananas, peppers, tomatoes, think acidic. If it's, if it's a fruit or vegetable, that's got a little bit of that acidic bite to it. There's a good chance. It's got a good dose of vitamin C going on. Um, but again, PCP is going to be a good resource talking about the DEXA scan, the food, um, talk to a dietitian, registered dietitians. Um, this is right in their wheelhouse. Um, so, I can certainly refer you to the right people, but this is really where I, where my bread and butter is, which is the exercise. Okay. So Wolf's law again, is to be able to uh, apply stress that tells your body, Hey, this is something we need and we're going to use it. And we got to be strong enough to use it. Um, and so some exercises are better than others. And that's, that's really the, one of the big points of this whole discussion today um which is there's a pretty big um i don't want to say a push but there's a, a big population um where walking is kind of the the gold standard right if you can just go for a walk every day eat an apple a day you'll be healthy forever right and that's unfortunately not really the case especially when it comes to exercise so some exercises are better than others at giving your body that bone stress putting the force through your bones that's going to start that process to lay down more healthy bone so lunges so that's 
I don't know if, how well the camera will pick this up, but a lunge, basically that step forward, kind of bending your front knee. Okay. That is called 1.1 times your body weight. So that's that chart to the, to the right. It's your peak vertical ground reaction force. So this is your daily dose of physics. If you haven't gotten that today. So just standing, right? I have one times my body weight as I stand here. That's what gravity is putting through me with however much I weigh. And then all of these numbers are how much more than my body weight is being applied to my bones when I do this activity. Okay, so a lunge, that's barely putting any more than my already existing body weight. So it's not really doing me a whole lot of good in terms of increasing the stress on my bones, right? It's just basically the same. And notice the very next thing on the list is walking. Okay, so going for a nice leisurely stroll, great for you for a lot of reasons. If you're not walking, you should be. But in terms of applying stress to your bones to increase bone health and bone strength, walking is not going to do it all by itself. Okay, so as we work up the list here, you'll find some surprising things. So a march in place, okay, where you're just kind of hiking, not going anywhere, a little bit more than walking. Running shows up shockingly quick on this list. It's about two and a half times your body weight, which running gets a bad rap of like, it's really hard on your body. You're putting all this force through all your joints and your bones, but it's actually only about two and a half times your body. Okay. As we move further, there's a step up. So imagine a 12 inch step. You got one foot kind of hiked up and you're just stepping up and stepping back down. That actually puts more force through your bones and your joints than running, which seems kind of crazy. Okay. There's what's called the jumping takeoff, which is basically just standing in place and hopping forward. Okay. That's going to bump us all the way up to three and a half times your body weight. And then here's where we get some surprising ones. A heel drop is a full body weight more force than running. And a heel drop is basically this, and the camera is not going to see my feet, but what you're doing is going up on your toes and then sitting down hard on your heels. Okay. Like you're just plopping down, um, from being up on your tiptoes, dropping those heels down hard. When they measure that through a force plate, there's more force going through the bones, especially of your lower extremities and your lumbar spine than running which crazy, um, a jump squat, understandably squatting down, jumping up and landing, um, 3.8. And then here's another surprising one, a foot stomp. So this is like, there's a big spider on the ground and you're just stomping it. Okay. The force that that puts through your bones is higher than squatting down and jumping up. So notice there's not this correlation between difficulty of an exercise and how much stress it puts through your bones. So if you ask me to do a hundred foot stomps, that's like no big deal, right? My foot might get a little sore, but if you ask me to do a hundred jump squats, I'm going to be sweating. I'm going to need to take breaks. Like I'm going to be dying, but there's this difference between difficulty of exercise and force that's being generated for bone stress. Okay. So then we get to the higher level stuff, vertical jump. Um, and then there's one that's chopped off, I think called a vertical squat jump, which is basically that jump squat with a little extra oomph. Okay. So you can do things that don't seem difficult, but apply the kind of stress that we want. Um, this is super nerdy. Again, it's research. I don't know that you've got this in your handout because it was just too much to put in there. Um, but basically this was a really cool trial that looked at a control group who did kind of the standard, um, home-based physical therapy exercise routine. So kind of the, the chair exercises, the sit and get fit crowd, um, so they're doing things like walking, lunges, calf raises, um, some like banded 
arm work or little dumbbells where they're just raising weights out, some stretching, things like that. And then they took this other group, which was women over 65, um, post-menopause, there were about 50 of them. And instead of the kind of sit and get fit exercise routine, they did two 30 minute sessions a week for eight months. And the types of exercise that they did were things like deadlifts, jumping chin-ups, an overhead press, a back squat, okay? Things that you would see like on the Olympics, okay? Envision that. And they would load them up pretty heavy. They would say, what's the maximum that you can lift? Okay, we're gonna start with 85% of that. So heavy, okay? And they would recheck what that maximum was. And every time that they could do seven repetitions of an exercise, they would bump up their weight by five pounds. And this went on for eight months. Okay. So they had all these high level exercises and they found where their starting point was. And then as they went, they would bump up their weight by five pounds. And what they found at the end of this was pretty fascinating. So graphs are hard, but if we look at that top chunk, right here this lsbmd that's lumbar spine bone mineral density okay so they took dexa scan before they took a dexa scan after and they said what does the bone mineral density of the lumbar spine look like in these two groups the sit and get fit low level exercise group and then the higher level progressive group over here the light gray is that sit and get fit crew. So their percentage dropped by over one full percent on that T-score. The higher level um, group increased by almost 3%. So pretty significant difference. And even if that control group had improved, it would be important to note that the higher level exercise group improved more but not only did they improve more that control group where they were just sitting walking stretching doing lower level exercises they actually got worse in terms of their bone mineral density in their lumbar spine which was pretty fascinating and then that whole bottom chunk is strength in different muscle groups and functional testing so walking speed maneuverability um lower extremity strength, back extensor strength, um, all these things that are really, really functional. They did a functional balance test. And in every single test, some more than others, but in every single test, that group that did the higher level progressive weight training had much improved scores relative to that sit and get fit program. So what does that mean? What can we take away from that trial and a bunch of other research? Um, to help you all and anyone that you know optimize your bone health. So the first one is specificity. And I think I gave you these all spelled out already. So specificity is the first one. What that means is when you get your DEXA scan, it should tell you here are the areas in your body where you've got the most porous bone. Here's where the issues are. Typically places like lumbar spine, hip, wrist, okay? Um, when you get that DEXA scan and you say, oh, it's my low back that's osteopenic or osteoporotic, and that's my weak point, that does not mean avoid that area. I'm like, oh, it's my back. I'm going to just work my arms and my legs and stay away from my back. It's actually the direct opposite. Be specific with your training. So if you have low scores in your back, target your back. Do it safely and we'll talk about that but we can't ignore the problem area instead we need to address the problem area so be specific with the exercises that you pick second is being progressive and this is what that study showed us is that you figure out your starting point wherever that may be as quote unquote low level as that may be and progress so if you find that starting point and you just live there and even if you're doing great exercises, if you never make it harder on yourself, 
then you're only going to improve by so much. So you've got to, as things get easier, make them harder on yourself. Because again, Wolf's Law, right? You apply stress to make change. So once those exercises aren't causing stress to your body anymore, because you've gotten a little stronger, you've got to apply more stress. So you add on five pounds, you add on five reps, you walk a little further, whatever the case may be. Reversibility. This is super, super important because if you've not had a DEXA scan and you're like, oh, maybe I need to go get one of those and you get one and lo and behold, you're in that osteoporosis category, like out of the blue, that's not the end of the world. So reversibility is basically saying, and what that study showed us, right, is that percentage can drop. So you can start in that osteoporosis category and you work your way back to an osteopenic category. You can start in an osteopenic category with a T-score and get yourself back to a normal, healthy range. As your bones grow and get stronger, you can go get another DEXA scan and they'll say, whoa, like you're, you're going opposite of your aging process, which is really cool and really encouraging. Um, Initial values, we talked about that, finding your baseline. Um, and this is kind of like the specificity thing as well, where the, the worse those initial values are, in terms of exercise and making a change, that's better. So if someone goes in with really healthy bones and a really great T-score, they're not going to make that much progress because they're already where they need to be. But... If you go in with really awful T-scores, what research has shown us is those are the people that are, that are going to make the most progress. You've got the most room to grow and your body kind of, it kind of wants to help out those bones. And so when you start an exercise routine, you're going to have drastic improvement really quick. And what that tells us too is we don't want to like put on the kid gloves if someone comes in with a really bad T-score. It's not like, well, I guess we're just doing chair exercises because your T-score is so bad. It's actually, again, the opposite. Those are the people where you want to really be not aggressive, but you don't want to shy away from the things that can really make a difference. And what we know is the things that really make a difference aren't sitting in a chair and doing chair exercises. It's doing these higher level, even though they don't seem like it, exercises, bouncing on your heels, stomping your feet, because you're going to make the most gains. And then the kind of downside is this diminished returns, right? Is at some point you're going to max out. There's just the aging process, everything else. At some point you're going to... Um, kind of hit, hit your max. And that's no different than me going to the gym and working out. Like at some point, our bodies just can't continue to progress and you can add weight, add reps, add weight, add reps. But by the time you're 97 years old, 98 years old, 99, like you're not just going to keep lifting the same weight forever and ever. My grandfather ran marathons into his sixties, healthy dude. But at some point he just couldn't do it anymore. And that's, that's a, f a fact of life, but it's, um, it's not to say we shouldn't work on it as we go. So, um, key types of exercise, and we've touched on these throughout. We're just going to give them names. So progressive resistance training, being progressive and adding weight and adding reps. That's the key there. And also that it's resistance training. Body weight exercise is great. Cool. Exercise is great. If y'all are going to the presentation later this afternoon, you'll hear all about that. And that is wonderful for a lot of things. For osteoporosis and bone health, we need resistance. And if not resistance, if that's not something that your body can handle for where you're starting, then at least weight bearing. Okay. And that kind of goes into these next ones. Oh, I think we got a video. We'll see if we get audio. If we don't, audio is not important. So don't, don't worry about it. So this is just an example um, of strengthening with weights and doing things that look like, whoa, that's significant. And then you look at how that compares to 
what you do in your normal daily life. And it doesn't actually look all that different, right? So you see someone doing this at the gym and you're like, dang, they're getting after it. But then you go home and you do things that are almost exactly the same. Uh, let's see if I can get back here. Blah, 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 blah. I got a... Sorry, my screens are blocked. There we go. Nope. <laughs> my Zoom thing is in the way. That's what's throwing me off. Okay. High velocity power training. So this is, again, just a name for the concepts we've already talked about. So doing things that are quicker movements and that are powerful movements and you're generating some speed. So things like going up on your toes and bouncing back down, right? Doesn't seem like a hard exercise, but what's happening? You're doing something quick and you're generating some oomph, okay? Same thing with the foot stomp, right? Seems easier than doing something like a lunge and it is on your muscles okay but because of the speed and the oomph that you're generating that's what's transferring stress to your bones we're going to skip the videos because it was a pain in the butt to get back to it but what these guys are doing is they're kind of moving weight quickly so this gentleman right here he's taking that weight from the floor and he's popping it up over his head and then he's going back down to the floor and then he's popping it up over his head and he's kind of getting this bounce with his lower body and he's moving that weight quickly up overhead. Okay, this lady, um, it's almost worth pulling up the video for this lady, but she's taking that weight, which again, it looks like, dang, she's in the Olympics, right? But that's a PVC pipe, so it weighs nothing. And those weights on the side, I think are five pounds, okay? So she's got 10 pounds, which is not crazy, okay? And what she's doing with it is she's picking it up from the floor and pushing it over her head. And she's doing it as quickly as she can, okay? And then she sets it down and she does a little hop over the bar, okay? Not real high and not real fast, but it's speedy and it's generating oomph through her lower body. And when she's pulling that weight up quickly, she's using her low back to move quickly. And then she's popping it up over her head so her upper extremities, her arms are working hard as well. Um, and that's where that weight bearing impact training comes in. Now that gets tricky with the upper extremities, okay? Because it's easy to weight bear through your feet, you stand on them, okay? Your arms is a little different. So doing things that are on all fours or even like a push up variation. So imagine like leaning on the wall, you're bearing weight through your arms or leaning on your kitchen counter and putting weight through your arms and doing any sort of push-up variation, shoulder tap, anything like that. This is another example. She's doing a little kind of shuffle step to the side and landing on one foot. Okay, so I don't know what time we got here. We got a little bit. So we're going to do a little sampler of this. So I don't know if y'all came prepared to work today, but we're going to work a little bit. So we've got three exercises that we're going to do together. Okay. And the, the style that this is called, it says up there is an EMOM, which is acronym for every minute on the minute. Okay, we're not going to do the full six minutes. We'll just do one round of this. But this is a great way to structure exercises for yourself. Um, you know, if you go to a workout class, you can bring this up um, where it, it builds in breaks and it builds in the allowance for you to do things at your own pace. So every minute... We're going to start an exercise and you have 40 seconds to do as many or as few as you want. And then you get 20 seconds of rest. So whether you do one repetition of the thing or 40 doesn't matter to me, matters to you, but 
you pick what you can handle. Okay. And you do that for 40 seconds and then you get 20 seconds to rest. When that next minute starts, then you start the next exercise and you do that one for 40 seconds, as many or as few as you want, 20 seconds to rest. And then you start the third one. And in this example, it was set up to be a six minute thing, which means you'd start back over and repeat those three exercises one more time. Okay. But you can do this with two exercises. You can do this with eight exercises, but it just gives you some structure. So you're not like doing three and you're like, oh, I think I'm just tired. And then you end up resting for five minutes instead of 20 seconds. Right. So, um, gives us some some structure. And then what I'm going to do is I'll pull up a timer here. And our exercises for today, we're going to keep it simple. Okay. And we've got enough wall space in here. I think we, we can do it. And if you're at home, I can't see you, but feel free to join us. Um, our first one is going to be either those heel drops where you're just standing, kind of bouncing heavy on your heels going up on your tiptoes and plopping back down. Or if you want to do some jumps, and again, I don't care about height. It's called loud jumping. So you're going to generate some noise under your feet. Okay. So you have 40 seconds of that. The next one is a wall clap push-up. So what that means is we'll find a stretch of wall. Okay. You're going to do a push-up and push off just enough that you can clap your hands and go back down. Okay. Now, if that's like, whoa, that's too much. I can't handle it. Okay. Bad shoulders, whatever. Then what I want you to do is just lean on the wall and then one at a time, take one hand off and tap your other shoulder. Okay. And what that does is it increases the weight bearing on one arm while the other one is moving. Okay. Not quite as dynamic, but again, we find ways to do what you can handle to start with. Okay. And then the third one, in honor of our hockey team doing what they did, um, we've got skater jumps. So what you're going to do is start on one foot. You can either step or you can jump to the other foot. And when you get there, I want you to do a little forward lean. Then you're going to hop or step to the other foot and a little forward lean. Okay. How far you lean entirely up to you how far you step or jump entirely up to you. So this can become a super dynamic, big jump, big bend, big jump back the other way, or it can literally be a normal length sidestep with just a little bend. Like you're going to pick something up off the floor before you go to the next one. Okay. And again, you do as many or as few of these as you want in 40 seconds, and then we get a break. Okay. Questions. Good to try it. All right, so for those of you with me, go find a stretch of wall somewhere for that second. Second one. We've got space in the back. We've got some cabinets over here. If you don't mind being on camera, you can come join me on the chalkboard here. You want a, a spot of honor at the front here? <laughs> All right. So what we're going to do here, we're going to do three rounds with 40 seconds of work and 20 seconds of rest. Well, if you're going to the pool later, you'll get to back float in there or something. Okay. Are we ready? Okay. Good to go. All right. And I'll, I'll do them with you. I'll turn this up nice and loud so everyone can hear. Got a little countdown. Let's go. All right. So we got the heel drops. I want you to feel like you're kind of getting jolted a little, right? Or if you're up for it, you can do those nice loud jumps. This seems like, what are we doing, right? But, there. but when you're at home, you're standing at the sink and you're thinking about this presentation, how stupid it was that he made you jump 
when you thought you were just going to listen to a presentation, you can do some of these little heel drops, right? So there's your 40 seconds. Take a little 20 second rest. So whether you did 10 or whether you did 100, doesn't matter for right now, okay? So then we'll turn around, find your stretch of wall or counter or whatever. And we're going to start in three, two, one. So you got to push up, kind of generate a little speed and clap those hands as you come off the wall. Or you can just do the shoulder tap, right? Where you're kind of moving one arm off. I want you to feel like you're generating a little bit of speed, a little bit of power. You're making those muscles work a little quicker than maybe they're used to. And you're feeling some weight through your arms. 10 seconds. <laughs> Yes. Good. Take a breather. Very nice. Should feel like you did a little work on that one. So we got 20 seconds to rest. And then this is maybe the most complicated one, which is those skater jumps or skater steps. So make sure you got a little room to your sides. This can be a jump or a step with a little bend. So step and bend forward, step and bend forward. If you're a golfer, it should feel like you're bending over to pick up your golf ball or your T, right? As you're kind of going side to side. And even if it's just a step, right? That's okay with a little bend. Step and bend, that'll work. Yep. This is a great exercise because it's putting force through your legs. And then that little bend is putting a little force through your back. And then if we had more time, we'd run through all this one more time and then you've done pretty much six minutes of continuous work with those built-in breaks you get your heart rate up a little bit but um a little sample of of what some dynamic weight bearing exercise can look like yeah oh shucks you stepped out at just the wrong time right you missed all the exercise <laughs> Okay, so what questions do we have after all of that? I've got my email up there um, and the office number up at the hospital and you can ask for Alex um, if you wanna call. Um, and I think I've got that on your sheet. If not, I'll give you a second to, to write it down before I take it away off the screen. But um, any questions that I can answer? Um, before I take off and head back to work. Yeah, elliptical machine. How would that rate up? So more than likely, it's going to be fairly low again. Because you can set the resistance. Right, but you're not getting the impact, right? And so sometimes that's that dynamic kind of movement um, is what's important. Now. An elliptical with heavy resistance or heavy-ish resistance um, would be better than something like walking, certainly, okay? Um, but not quite as good as some of the more um, dynamic resisted stuff, so. Does the arthritis have anything to do with bones? Or is that the muscle like this? I can think of yeah. So bursitis is um, a bursa is like a a little pillow. Basically, it's a, a cushion between structures that can get easily irritated. So that's kind of a different thing. It's a not a muscle. It's not a bone. It's kind of its own little thing. Um, but it usually it's just it's. I would put it in the like connective tissue category. Um, Think of it like a water balloon or something. It, it usually sits between muscles or between a muscle and a bone and just provides some cushion. It can deteriorate. It can get irritated. Yeah. Yeah. If it's getting too pinched, then it can get irritated. Does this exercise help anything like that? For sure. For sure. Um, research into this kind of higher level weight bearing resisted stuff 
um, is certainly not limited to being helpful for osteoporosis. Um, arthritis, bursitis, all that stuff. Generally speaking, this style of exercise has a lot of good research for being helpful in a lot of areas. So arthritis, um, to your, to your question, um, is a lot of times a, a bone and joint issue, right? Causes a lot of pain, inflammation, stuff like that. So, um, that certainly can be a limitation. Um, I don't know if you're planning on going to the, the session that Lisa's putting on over at the pool later today. Um, but that is on arthritis. And so that'd be a great, um, kind of addition to this, this talk this morning. So bursitis and arthritis has nothing to do with not, not directly, okay. not directly. So like the DEXA scan, so bone say. mineral density, that's not necessarily going to tell you anything about bursitis or arthritis. Yep. Different, different thing. Other questions. Great question though. Um, okay. How about the new step that I used at the wellness center? Mm -hmm. What's the effect of that compared to say that I need to yeah. So I would put that in a very similar category to the elliptical, where if you're putting some pretty beefy resistance through it and your muscles are burning and you're, you're working pretty quick and you're getting some of that dynamic movement, that's really helpful. Um, and really if you're kind of sticking with some of those themes that we talked about with it being progressive resistance and you're making it hard enough on yourself that you're wore out and your muscles are burning, then you're getting great benefit from that. Um, but something like walking on the treadmill, especially if you're doing things like increasing incline or speed, or even like we talked about with those jumps and stomps, trying to be a little more impactful through your steps, or you're making it more of a march, things like that. In terms of bone stress, that's going to be more beneficial probably. So um, lots of benefit to the new steps and the ellipticals from a muscular perspective and just an overall health perspective, um, in terms of the, the bone health, not, not like the peak thing, not the best thing you can do. Certainly not the worst. So other questions. Yeah. Yeah. Then 10 minutes on the elliptical. Right. And that's, that's where you can even apply some of these principles though, right? If you've been cruising on your elliptical every morning for 30 minutes and you get off and you're like, oh, that was fun, you know, and you're not sweating and you're not breathing hard. And like, you probably need to dial up that resistance to the point where you're doing 10 minutes and feeling like you're ready for a break, right? We got to apply that stress to your body. So other questions, again, if you think of more later on, shoot me an email, um, Give me a call, whatever the case may be. Um, questions? I know there's one from the from the online folks about the handouts. You on that? Perfect. 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 Cool. Well, I will um, head on out of here and have fun at the pool. I'm bummed that I have patients this afternoon and I can't go jump in the pool with you all and with Lisa. Um, that'd be a lot of fun, but. How long, you. How long did the septum when someone comes to you for? So up at the hospital, if you're there for physical therapy, it's about a 45 minute session. So um, again, we can tailor that however we need to work in breaks, however we need to, but a standard session is, is 45 minutes. Yep. Good question. Thank you very much, Ellie. Thank you. Yes, you're very welcome.